I'm going to try to give you a perspective from the feed industry and, and kind of talk through the rule and, and talk through the, the process of the VFD from, from the feed manufacturer's perspective. And a lot of these slides that, uh, that I'm going to put up today, uh, I, I use them in giving presentations to the feed industry. And so you guys may know a lot more, uh, I'm sure you know a lot more about this uh, this VFD rule than, than most of the audiences that I've talked to, so we, we may jump through some of these slides pretty quick and, and talk a little bit more about the process. I, I work for AFIA, American Feed Industry Association, uh, but I've only been with uh, AFIA for, since uh, last May, so not quite a year yet, and I, I've spent the majority of my career in the feed industry uh, working, uh, I worked for a, a, a farmer-owned cooperative for 31 years, and most of that time has been spent in, in different management positions in, feed, in the feed division. The last last position I had was about 18 years of, man, of managing a feed plant in Park City, Kentucky. And so I'm coming at you from a, a, a feed manufacturer's perspective, and, and uh, mostly what I do with our association is deal with the agencies of OSHA, DOT, EPA, uh, but we're all kind of, all of the team kind of works with, with, with different pieces of FDA, especially with FISMA coming on and VSD all at the same time, so we're, we're kind of spreading these presentations out. This, this slide gives you a little bit about our association. Uh, we represent the majority of the feed manufactured in the U.S. We have over 600 members. Any, anybody that has anything to do with feed manufacturing, ingredient suppliers, feed, feed manufacturers, equipment manufacturers for the industry. And so we represent all of those. About 75% of the tonnage uh, that's manufactured in the U.S., which is about 173 million tons when that was uh, that slide was put together. We were founded back in 1909, and our home office is in Arlington, Virginia. This is a slide that kind of looks, tells you what all goes in the feed, and, and you see all the different uh, ingredients and, and, and things. That, and one thing that, that's not on that slide is medications, and, and medications is a big part of what we do. And a little bit of history about the rule, you know, it was signed back in 1996, October of 1996, President Clinton signed this into law, and it created this new category of drugs, and initially there were just, uh, I think there were three drugs and five uses, uh, but it, it, it created this category of drugs that had to be, had to have a veterinary, and a veterinary order to be used. And so it offered this uh, another alternative or an alternative to a prescription. And what I've been told is not really a prescription under federal or state law, uh, but it's you know the way we look at it in the feed industry, it, 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 it's, it acts pretty much like a prescription. The first drug was approved in 1996 for swine, and then there were two more, and there were five uses, and and. Quite honestly, I've, I've been in, the, I was working at a plant in Durham, North Carolina in 1996. I was managing that plant and I don't think the ink had dried on the law before I got my first BFD to fool with. And, but that's the only one in my career that I've done that I fooled with. It just kind of sat there and a lot of the, the, the veterinarians didn't prescribe those drugs or at least in the feed facilities that I was working in. So we hadn't. Uh, it's not been something that's been in, in as wide a use as what's getting ready to take place. And basically it just requires a lot more documentation. And, and, and so we're going to see why, why, why did we, why is there, the, why make the changes now, why change in 2015 from what was there in 1996 and of course it's this growing concern over this antimicrobial resistance. In, in the human drugs and these the threats and so and, and AFI believes this is the right thing to do. It's just we've just got to get through some of the hurdles of implementing it and, and working through the process. And so what documents are out there? Uh, this the first document that we've seen was 209. Document 209 came out in 2012. 
and it talked about the judicious use strategy. Uh, the second one was document 213, and it talked about the medically important uh, antibiotics and, and limiting them to therape therapeutic use. And so getting rid of those real low levels and, and only for uh, treatment of the diseases and getting rid of the labels for feed efficiency and growth promotion, that was the main thing there. And of course in 2015, last June is when the, the final rule came out. And there is one other draft document that should get approved any time now, is uh, document 233 which finalizes the form and the approval process for, for new drugs. And so that's that's the information that we have that, that's out there. And so the goals of this is the supervision of the licensed veterinarians. So we, uh, FDA wants licensed veterinarians to be uh, part of this process and we'll remove these uh, growth promotion and feed efficiency indications on the label, those low use and, and, and just a more judicious use of these medically important antibiotics in, in the food producing animals. This is the list of drugs that we know of uh, right now. And see, a lot of those are, are familiar. Uh, some of them uh, are widely used and some of them are not. And, and so then I'm sure that as we go, uh, as time moves on, maybe they may be more added added to this list, but this is what we know of right now from FDA. So let's talk about the process. It's, it's a rather simple process. Uh, uh, the, a lawful VFD form has to be filled out by a licensed veterinarian before any medicated feed can be delivered to the producer. Now, not manufactured, but delivered, and we'll talk about the significance of that as we get on down the road in the presentation. But You've got to have that VFD form filled out. Purchases of the drugs or the medicated feed triggers two types of letters that we'll talk about a little bit more in detail. There's the use letter that goes back to FDA that puts you on the radar as a distributor, and then there's the acknowledgement letter that goes back to the supplier. And that acknowledgement letter is, is what FDA has put in the rule for to build in accountability. And, and really what it's saying is we acknowledge we know about the rule and we're going to comply with it. So it, it build in, builds in some accountability between the drug suppliers, the feed plants, and, and the distributors. Now this is a, a I'm, I'm kind of a picture type guy, visual guy, so this, this is a little bit better uh, visual for me to see the process. So you see the vet, it all starts with the veterinarian. He starts with writing that original order. Now he can give that order to the producer, and then it can go to the producer to the feed distributor, or he can give that to the feed to the producer and the feed distributor at the same time. As we move more into the electronic format, which is I, I believe is the way we're going to see these uh, VFDs delivered in the future, it'll it'll probably happen simultaneously. The the producer will declare a a, a, feed, a, a feed supplier and that VFD will go to the producer and the feed supplier at the same time. Then that triggers those the letter for the feed producer is, or the distributor is responsible for sending those two letters. And they're just one-time letters that gets you on the radar and builds in the accountability. So who can be classified as a distributor in this rule? And it's very important, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but the distributor is the person or the, the entity that sells the feed to the final producer that owns the animals. It can be the feed mill. If you, if you're a, if you run a feed plant and you sell directly to the farmer, then you're, you're the feed, the distributor in that instance. But it can also be the retail establishment. This is new. Uh, the retail establishment didn't have a lot to do with the old rule. In this rule, they can be a, the distributor. And in some rare instances, it can also even be the producer in an instance of, a, say, a feedlot where they have their own manufacturing facility on site and <clears throat> they may be buying the type A medicated articles, but they still have to have a vet order to be able to make feed and use them. So, and that, that gets kind of complicated when you're the, the customer and the distributor also. So why is that so important who the distributor is? 
it's because the major paperwork requirement falls on that distributor. And that's what's a little bit different about this new rule than the old rule. The paperwork falls on who's declared as the distributor. Retail stores didn't have a whole lot to do in the old rule. And, and all of a sudden they're going to be thrust in the middle of this. Let's, let's back up and talk about that for just a minute. Think about the different scenarios that you can think of. Say, and I worked for a, a local farmer owned co op and we sold the majority of our tonnage through a dealer network. And if, if, if that feed plant sells all of its tonnage through that dealer network and they, they have zero direct customers, even though they may deliver it directly to the farm, but if, if the billing goes from the retail store to the farmer, then that feed plan is not the distributor in that instance. And so the, a lot of the paperwork requirement is removed from the feed mill in that instance. And the retail store then becomes that, that uh, feed distributor according to this new rule and that paperwork requirement then will fall on that retail store. If you're a feed plant and you sell all to direct customers, then you're the distributor now and, and really the, the the scenario that's probably going to be most common is is a plant that has both circumstances where they may have a few large direct customers and they may have a lot of small customers that buy through the retail uh, dealer uh, network and so they may have some customers that they have to keep the VFD records on and some that they don't and so it gets a little complicated when you when you got to figure out which which uh, place you fall into. So, yeah. There's a conversation that goes on with the inspector at the state level and the federal level. You got a retail store. Did the inspector inspect the retail store? Or well, that's a, that's a good question. They never have. That's right. But, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get in this paperwork requirement and get, how does that, see right now the retail store, stores are not on their radar. <coughs> This, this use letter puts them on the radar screen. If they become a distributor, then they're on FDA's radar screen. Now, we don't know how much FDA is going to come in and inspect. We don't know how, I, I really don't know how much they've inspected veterinarians in, this, in the old process, probably very little. But they did inspect the feed mills. They came into the feed plants and, and looked at all through all the records. Uh, and, and so this, that's some of the stuff that we don't know. And so the next question that comes up in that sequence, if they haven't been inspecting feed stores, and they do inspect the feed store, and the feed store is out of compliance based on records, does that fall back on the feed manufacturer that supplied the feed store? No. Not supposed to. According to FDA, that that will be a violation of that feed distributor, which is that retail store. If the feed plant has done everything they're supposed to do, and I've got a slide in here we'll talk about what the feed plant's responsible for, what the feed distributor's responsible for, and, and how that the difference is. If that's true, if there's been a change in who owns the product, but a lot of those feed stores have consignments from the feed mill. Hmm. The feed's on the floor, it's still inventory based yeah. on the ownership. Yeah, now the that, that could create uh, an issue. It's who owns the product, because the, the distributor, uh, determination is, is when it changes from the the, or the distributor to the to the producer. It's a change in ownership. Yeah, change in ownership of that product. In relation to that, then what's the final penalty? Fine or penalty for not being in compliance do you have? Know? We don't know. And that seems to be a question. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. We hadn't got an answer from FDA on that. As I walk through a little bit more of these requirements, some of this may become a little bit clearer. Uh, so let's look at the paperwork requirements for the distributor. And think about the distributor in those scenarios I talked about. You, the distributor may be the feed mill, the distributor may be the retail establishment. But the requirements are the same if you're the distributor. You've got to maintain all those records for two years. You've got to keep, keep those on file so if the inspector comes in, is I want to see your records uh, and you can show it to them. 
you've got to send this one time letter to F back to FDA that basically says I'm a distributor of BFD medicated feeds and so you're you're putting yourself on the radar screen at that point in time and that's what's going to give FDA the right to inspect once you put yourself on that radar screen and you have to if you're going to sell that product to the farmer to the producer you've got to send that one-time letter to the FDA and says we're, we're going to be a distributor of, of BFD medicated feeds. Now if you're the feed plant, if you don't have any direct customers, you don't have to send that letter and all of a sudden you're off their radar screen. You, won't, you, shouldn't, be, you shouldn't be inspected for records that have to do with uh, BFDs if you have zero customers that you sell directly to. That, that's going to be a rare occasion though for most feed plants. The second letter is this acknowledgement letter and this is where the accountability comes in. The, the distributor has to send an acknowledgement letter back up the chain one level. So if you're the feed plant, you're looking at where you get your type A medicated articles from. And so you're, you know, whatever that distributor is, whoever you buy those from, you send that letter backwards one step and say, we know the rule, we're going to comply with the rule, we're not going to make or distribute any feed without a BFD or without a similar acknowledgement letter if we're selling it down the chain to another distributor. If you're the feed, if you're the feed store, your supplier is the feed mill. So you send your acknowledgement letter back, backwards one step to the feed mill. Say, we know the rule, we know we can't sell any medicated VFD feeds to a producer without a VFD order, and that we're going to comply with the rule. So that kind of builds in a little bit of accountability into the process, and that's what FDA was after. So let's look at the manufacturer and, and kind of take the distributor out of the equation and just look at the What's the responsibility of the feed manufacturer in this entire equation, whether you're the distributor or not? You are still responsible to make sure that the feed that you manufacture is legal. <coughs> and, and we kind of laugh at that, but a, a lot of veterinarians that write, that are going to be writing this VFDs, they're not real familiar with the, the feed added continuum. And this is not something they're used to doing is writing BFD orders for medicated feeds, feed mills still got to look at that and say it's legal or it's not. He may write a prescription that's told that's a combination of two illegal drugs or illegal levels. You still got to look at that and make sure it matches the feed addict companion to make sure it's a legal use of that drug. Just because a VFD is written by a vet, a licensed vet doesn't give a feed mill authorized authorization to make an illegal feed. Still got to make sure the tag's right. Still got to make sure your Medicaid feed label is correct. And these are responsibilities that are already there for the feed manufacturers and they're very good at that. You have to send that one time letter of intent back to FDA only if you sell feed directly to the farmer. <laughs> Which, and if you, if you have one direct customer out of your plant that you're going to sell a medicated feed to, a BFD medicated feed to, you've got to send that letter back to FDA. Now, if you don't have any, you may have some direct customers that don't buy any BFD medicated feed. You're still not a BFD uh, uh, medicated feed facility in their eyes. So you, don't have, you only have to send that letter if you distribute it directly to the producer. And then you do have to keep the records for two years if you have customers that are direct that, that buy directly from you as the feed feed plant. And then you've got to send that one time letter back up one step in the process. Whoever you buy your type A medicated articles from, you got to send that back. So those are the requirements of the feed plant, of the manufacturer. So you can kind of see the original rule. All the record keeping requirements fell on the feed manufacturer. They had to keep that, keep all of those records. The new rule, we've drawn the retail establishment into it. And so he has to keep the records if he's the one selling directly to the farmer. So it kind of brings in another uh, 
entity there. So the form is in three parts. Uh, quick question. Uh -huh. So I'm going to plead a little ignorance here. So a licensed female versus a farm female on the farm, just whether they can handle. Yeah, if you're, if, unless you've got a Medicaid fee license, you can't buy the type A yeah. Medicaid articles anyway. So there, all those all those will be manufacturing VFD feed should already be licensed. Yeah. As a, as a, yeah. With the FDA anyway, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah, they should already be licensed. Either the distributor manufacturer also will have to keep a uh, rolling inventory where all those went as well, or will that be part of the responsibility? For example, if you're even just distributing here to retail, will the manufacturer have to show where each of the BF or the BFD product came in and went out? If you're not the distributor in FDA's eyes, if you're not selling that product directly to the customer, you don't have to keep the records. You can, if you got a retail store out there and they've got 20 customers that, and, and this is what I think, this is what Gary thinks is going to happen in the, practically. I think the veterinarians are going to have relationships with the retail stores in an area and they're going to prescribe certain medications and they're probably going to design some line feeds that that feed manufacturer will make so that if farmer A has a disease and farmer B has the same disease and farmer C has it, they're going, to, they're going to write orders for the same feed. And what's eventually going to happen is that retail store can keep that feed, if it's a back feed, he can keep it on the floor. Now he can't let it go out the door without that feed, without that order. And the feed manufacturer can make as many tons of that and sell it to that retail store he don't have to see the veterinary feed directly, the oil. He doesn't have to see that. He can just make tons and ship it to the store. The store has to track the incoming and the outgoing and match it to the producer and make sure each each order is filled the way it's supposed to feel, be filled. So the form's three parts. The vet keeps the first part. He keeps the original. The second part, uh, and, and all that's got to be maintained for two years. Uh, one, the producer gets a, a, the second part and then the distributor, whether it be the feed mill or the retail store, gets that third part. <clears throat> and so that's kind of, that's that's how the form works. Uh, the form's got to be very specific to animals, class, uh, a group of animals, uh, the drug levels, everything on that form is very, very specific, the exact indications of use. I got another slide over here. that that lists all the different things that we know is going to be on that form. There can't be any deviations from legal levels, any indications or species or anything. All that's got to be legal. Uh, and this is where the feed uh, company will kind of come more into play because I think there will probably be some VFD orders to be written that won't be legal. And so it'll have to be pushed back up the chain, corrected, and then come back down. The feed company will have to make sure everything's legal. This is all the things that we see that's going to be on the form. Uh, drug name, amount, indication of use, the location of the farm, the number and the, the kind of animals, the, the if it's calves or if it's uh, uh, adult animals, whatever it is, the name, address, and phone number and the signature, that veterinarian's got to be on there. Treatment date, VFD date, all the withdrawal times and feeding instructions, all those things have to be on there. Any kind of warning statement has to be on there. Now there's something new is this affirmation statement, and, and that's that's something that wasn't on the old form, but on that, that part the veterinarian has to choose one of these three options. One of them can be this drug can be used on its own uh, at this level, no other combinations are allowed. He can choose the second option that says it can be used with this particular other drug that I'm going to allow you to, to mix with this particular order. Or that third option he can choose, it can be used with any legal combination of any other drug. So he, he's got those three options. Probably most of the time they'll choose that third option to, to allow the most flexibility is my thinking, but I'm, I don't know for sure. Some of the practical issues that we see is this original form is retained by the vets. Copies go out to the other, and, and when it first starts out, 
it's probably going to be a paper form. It may be, uh, and we're a little worried that the, the second part and the third part may not be as legible as we need it to be. Uh, eventually, it will. I think it will go all to electronic uh, with some of these companies that are, are developing a good system to be able to use this, uh, the electronic methods, and FDA is going to allow that, which is going to be very, very helpful. Faxes and, and electronic VFDs are allowed, but phone ins are not. You can't can't call your vet up and say I got some sick calves. Phone in VFD to the feed plant or the feed store so I can go buy and pick it up. That's not allowed. They've got to write that thing out, fill out all the paperwork, and do it correctly. Feed distributors can deliver. They don't have to fill that entire order all on one day. It could be a VFD order that lasts for 90 days. And so if it's for bulk feed, it can be delivered in smaller amounts. And so uh, the feed, whoever the distributor is, has to keep up with that tonnage going out the door to make sure it matches that order. And delivering that feed to the farm before the producer has that VFD form in hand and before the distributor has that VFD form in hand is not allowed. You've got to have that. Uh, every, uh, everything's got to be in order uh, before you, you deliver that feed to the farm. Now, again, it's delivered to the farm. It's not manufactured. The feed company can make as many tons of a, of a BFD medicated feed as they want to make, put it on the floor. It just can't be sold to anybody without a BFD order. Now, it'd be kind of stupid to make a bunch of feed without a BFD order unless it's something that you've kind of got a history on. Do you have a question there? Yeah, on your last slide, do they have an amount on that required on the VFD? Yeah. I didn't, I missed it, I'm sorry. On, on this one? Yeah. I did on Yeah, drug, drug name and the amount and then the yeah. indications. So of that's these. the amount of feed and not the amount of drug. Well, it, or, yeah, or the, it'll be the drug. rate. Yeah, it'll be the drug levels and it, that'll yeah. all be included in the feeding instructions. I mean, the one question has always been on how long or how much is the VFD good for, it, right? I mean, if yeah. you have a and so where where is that falling out now? From the There's supposed to be a, uh, uh, an expiration date okay. that the vet puts on there. I don't think I've got that listed on there, but there is there's supposed to be an expiration okay. date. So there's some uh, we we've seen some funny answers from FDA on on, on some questions that's uh, uh, been put back to them. Uh, I thought I really understood the rule really well for uh, some of the answers that we've been getting. One of them in particular that kind of threw me for a loop was we had a producer asked FDA, okay, I've got some pigs that's not on the farm yet. They're coming in three weeks from now, and I need a VFD order ready so I can have the feed ready on the farm to feed those animals when they get there. You know, and I'm thinking, I know the answer to that. The rule was put in place to stop that kind of stuff. But the rule was put in place and said the vet's got to be on the farm, look at the animal, diagnose the animals, mm -hmm. and only prescribe the drug if needed. And so we thought we knew the answer. FDA comes back and says, well, you'll be able to get a VFD order in that instance. And so it just kind of blew us away. And this is the guy that's putting on all the webinars for FDA on how this rule is supposed to work, and I didn't understand that answer, so we'll, we'll have to kind of see how that works out. Well, I think you might be referencing Dr. Flynn. Who? Bill Flynn. No, uh, Dragon, I think she is. Yeah. Okay, so we had that conversation in two instances, and the way it was said to us was if that was a normal operational procedure and that other pigs had come in previous and the veterinarian was under the understanding that those type of pigs or calves were routinely brought from the same source and there was a precedence that's and he could do it that's what qualifies and th that that makes a little more sense so he didn't qualify that answer that way when we first heard it and you know richard sellers i called richard i said richard this blows my mind i thought i understood this he said, I'm just as blown away as you are by that answer. We'll have to do a little more investigating. But that makes a little more sense. If there's president there set, then that, that would make a little bit more sense. So. Where did we get here? I think we got through this slide. Yeah. Uh, 
some of the current challenges uh, feed companies policing the veterinarians for making sure that VFD order is legal making sure it's correct uh, mm. reviewing it and making sure the use the, the they, they're prescribing it properly and the levels are right and the kind of make sure there's no illegal combinations it's going to happen uh, veterinarians are not used to formulating feed yet and I think it'll all work itself out uh, after everybody kind of gets in more into this process but here's what's going to happen sometimes initially is the farmers going to get the animals in a scenario like we just described and they're going to be sick the vet's going to be on the farm he's going to write an order and for a drug that's going to for treatment he's going to give it to the producer the producer is going to take it to the retail store the retail store is going to say we'll get you some feed out there this afternoon or tomorrow he's going to send it up the line to his feed plant and the feed the quality guy at the feed plant is going to look at and say this is wrong this is illegal I can't put that drug in at that level uh, the way the vets prescribed it so what's got to happen then it's got to go back it's just got to go back through the chain go back to the retail store back to the vet and then there's going to be a conversation between the feed company and the vet and they'll get all this worked out but what's happening all along is, is animals are out of feed and so we're going to probably see some of that and that, that's going to be a challenge at first uh, but FDA has clearly said veterinarians are responsible and, and so there's going to be some education at the veterinary level we think uh, failure to return that original form used to be an issue it's not going to be an issue any longer with these changes uh, because the vet keeps the original and copies go down the line uh, feed feed plants may not even have to see it for, for uh, some of these feeds that line feeds that their VFD feeds that they're used to selling lots of tons of could have issues initially in the paper forms where they're handwritten and it's in triplicate it may be hard to read so that's some of the challenges that we, we think we see. More approvals means more paperwork. Uh, obviously, you've seen the list of drugs. Uh, there's a lot more drugs than those three that used to be there. And, and there's a lot more. We, I, we can see this, you know, this, this process is going to be used a lot more than it is now. And so it's going to increase the paperwork requirement across the board. Veterinarians are going to be doing a lot of these. And, <clears throat> feed distributors could be put at a disadvantage when the producer can't be served a prop because of incorrect form. I talked about that a while ago. Storing this medicated feed, uh, talked about the scenario of line feeds uh, that we're, we're a, a veterinarian is going to have a relationship with the stores and he's going to prescribe certain feed. I, I really see that's what's going to happen. Those conversations are already taking place and that's probably the right way to go. To make this work efficiently but then the, somebody's still got to manage that inventory and and somebody's got to be accountable for that inventory and it, it, it really falls on who that distributor is and so there could be some issues there but I think we'll be able to work through it uh, these are some of the future challenges that we see how's all this going to happen is it going to phase in is it going to happen up we know the rule starts uh, January 1 2017 How's the drug sponsors going to work with this? Are they going to change their tags and their labels all at one time? Is FDA going to require training for vets? Are they going to have enforcement? Somebody asked that a while ago. Is FDA going to enforce at the veterinary level? They say they are, uh, but I didn't see anything. Hadn't seen anything in the rule that puts the veterinarians on the radar screen yet. So we'll have to see. Uh, the retail stores are going to become. They're going to get on the radar screen. So I, I see FDA walking into those when they see those <coughs> uh, intent to distribute letters. And, and so we're, the big question is, is there going to be enough enforcement there from FDA? We've asked, we ask this daily when we talk about FISMA, is there going to be enough FDA folks uh, walking the, the, the streets to enforce it also? So that, that's a big question that we have. We're trying to address, AFI has been real actively involved in trying to address some of these issues with uh, FDA. And they so far they've been very agreeable to uh, orderly phase in. I think they're, they're working very well with the drug sponsors. 
and I think what we're going to see is they're going to allow a, a sticker because come December, the last day of December, all if you've got old <laughs> bags of CTC in your feed plant, it's 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 wrong. It's labeled wrong, <laughs> and FDA could say, well, it's wrong. You got to throw it away. They could walk into the feed mill, write you a citation, make you throw it all away, but. They're, they're not going to do that. I don't, we would pretty well think they're going to allow a sticker that says for this premix, it would be if the order is required beginning January 1. And all those uh, lower use indication usages will be no good anymore. But I think they're going to allow that supply to be exhausted. And we, we're going to help out a lot with that, hopefully. The form should already be in place should already be being used for those few uh, uh, BFD drugs that are out there, so, but we're probably we're not seeing a lot because there's not a lot of those used as, as, as much as it'll, the new, when the new drugs come online in, in 2017 in January is when we'll start seeing a lot of that form. Summer and fall of this year, the drug sponsors are going to start getting in contact with feed distributors and the feed plants and the feed companies and making these label changes uh, and, and communicating that. Uh, and then on January 1, 2017, all those low use growth promotion feed efficiency uh, uh, claims need to go away. Uh, and, but you can still use those premixes. And you just got to use them in a legal way. You got to make sure you got a valid VFD before you uh, allow, allow feed to be sold to the producer. And they're likely going to allow some time. And you know, come December the 31st, all that supply is not going to magically disappear. You're going to have bags of medicated premixes. You're going to have bags of medicated feed in retail stores. And and, and uh, what I don't understand, what we don't know, is what medicated feed that may be out there in retail store, what's going to happen to that. It's a lot easier to solve the problem of, of the type A medicated articles that are in the feed plants, but uh, we think FDA is going to allow you to, I th sometime probably this fall, that most all the drug sponsors will shift over and start packaging in their new package with the new correct labels, and then we'll, we'll still be able to use that uh, old supply up until it's gone. We're going to help with a survey. Uh, hopefully sometime in the next few weeks we're going to get a survey out to the industry asking for dollar volume and the premixes that they've got in <laughs> hand that's out there and hopefully that's going to be used as a baseline. We'll probably do another survey again in November and maybe one next uh, July if we need to. And, and this will be used to, if we have to go back to FDA and say, hey, we need a little bit more time to exhaust this supply to keep FDA from walking into a feed plant and, as long, and, and writing you a citation for having a bag of this old premix still there. If it's still in date and if you're using it correctly with a BFD order, everything should be in, in, in order and FDA should be fine with that. <coughs> this last slide is, is the resources that are out there. We participated with Feed Stuff, so they've been a good partner for us. We did some webinars. Uh, and they're on our website. They're also on Feed Stuff's website that you can go back and listen to. And this, this is they uh, Feed Stuff has got the, uh, a page on their website called VFD Central. It's got a lot of good information there. And then FDA's website's got it. They keep it constantly updated. Got a lot of good information there on, on what's uh, what's going on also. And so there's, there's lots of good resources out there. And hopefully as we move down the road and, 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 and move towards implementation that we want to work, uh, help our industry work with FDA to get to make a smooth transition to this group.